Hello everybody and welcome to another discussion on the COVID-19 pandemic and especially today on our children and what can we expect when they maybe start going back to schools. I am privileged to speak to Dr. Fiona Kritzinger, a pediatric pulmonologist, on a follow-up discussion on how do we manage our children and what are the risks for the children. I'm Dr. Skalk Berger from Dr. Luke on Call and welcome Dr. Fiona Kritzinger. Thank you very much. Nice to be here, Skalk. Yeah, it's wonderful to have a, um, a talk again. And um, yes, the um, you know I think with one of the buzzwords that we've been seeing is are the children super spreaders or not? And I think really, like you said before, initially what we knew is that maybe they can spread the virus a lot, and we should lock down and we should keep the children out of the schools. But it looks like um, some evidence across the world that it's not quite the case. Yes, exactly. I think, I mean, obviously, uh, the last two, three months, we've learned a lot about the pandemic and what was assumed and based on assumptions primarily around previous influenza epidemics, like the H1N1 flu epidemic um, and previous SARS epidemics, there was a, a, a genuine assumption that the same is going to be for now, for COVID and relevant. However, as time has gone on and more studies have come to light, um, that is actually not true. Um, what we've seen from case reports from some of the Netherlands studies, there's another example of one child who was in contact with 100 children at a ski resort in the French Alps, and there was not one single secondary case and infection from that one child. There's the study of New South Wales, where there were nine kids and nine staff members in the school that tested positive. And of the 735 children and 128 staff members, not a single other person got infected from those initial 18 cases. The data suggests that our initial assumption was wrong, that children are not super spreaders of the virus and that the vast majority of children will get infected in a family cluster, in a household, and they're very rarely responsible for the spread of the infection in a household or in a school environment. Mm. Yeah, well, that's, that's really fascinating information. And it's, it's great to, like you say, to have hard evidence that we could see, because obviously our you know, ministry and all over the world, all the ministries have to decide on education, do they open schools or not. And the burning question on every mother and father's lips are, you know, can my child go back to school? Will it be safe? Do I send them? Yes, yes. I think it's such a relevant question. And, and then as the lockdown has continued, a, a lot of my telephone consults and virtual consults and email correspondence with parents is around that very question. And my advice, and obviously I can't speak for the government, I can't speak for the minister, um, but reading the data and and bearing in mind that there is no winter without risk. Every winter, there is a risk. That risk may be influenza related, it may be RSV related. So we see many viral infections in children, young children, every winter. So bearing in mind that there is a background risk that we live with and that we used to and that we're comfortable with. If I read the data correctly, I honestly do not believe that there's an exceptionally high risk that is completely different to previous winters for children. And I'm, when I say children, I mean, obviously, healthy children without any serious significant comorbidities. So my advice to parents is where it is possible, a family should weigh up the benefits of going back to school and against the harms of staying at home. And I think there's, there is significant impact on staying at home. We know socially, emotionally, psychologically, even economically, you know, 25% of healthcare workers or essential service workers have child caring responsibilities. And so we cannot just look at the virus and the potential risk of the virus, but we also have to look at the potential harms of keeping children in a prolonged lockdown that isn't actually supported by science. So my advice is where it's possible and where schools make plans to keep to the basics of more social distancing, hand hygiene, 
keeping a distance of one and a half meters between the teacher and the children. I think it's there's every reason to allow children in a, you know progressive strategic way back into the schools. So I think there's a lot that can be done um, practically to allow children to return to school safely. And of course, if there's constant monitoring uh, and awareness and parents don't send their children to school when they have symptoms, the risks can be minimized to such numbers that I don't feel it's any different to any other winter. Thank you. That's really insightful. And I think very practical advice. Um, Dr. Fiona, can you give us maybe a, 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 some guidance on certain children that are at higher risk and that might be sort of dealt with a little bit differently? Yes, again, I think, you know, Skull, we are on uncharted territory and we, we do not have hard facts. We, I mean, I think our gut feeling again tells us we need to look carefully at children with serious underlying cardiac disease, serious lung disease or immune suppression. So I would say those three categories and then what, what is coming from the adult data, and I don't know yet how relevant that is for school going children, but it may be for adolescents, is obviously diabetes and obesity. Um, and I would suggest to parents that if your child falls into that category to set up an appointment with your specialist, whoever it is that takes care of that child's chronic condition and knows that child really well, to have an individual discussion around risk. But I would never make a blanket statement to say that all my patients, all my pulmonology patients, they all have to stay at home. In fact, the vast majority of them I have recommended to try and get back to school and get back in the safest possible way. So I think there are ways I think we need to those who identify uh, that have those concerns, please get in touch with your pediatrician or your specialist and have a personal discussion around it. Because I think, you know, we cannot just make decisions based on fear. We have to try and make rational decisions based on individual risk and individual circumstances. Yeah, that reminds me of a question that I've had a couple of times. You almost confirmed it for me now. People ask about asthma. What if my child only uses a, um, an inhaler to help them when, with sport? Must Are they now a high-risk case? And surely we haven't got any data that they should stay at home. No, no, definitely not. And, you know, I mean, even uh, serious uh, chronic lung conditions like cystic fibrosis, for example, we've had wonderful reassuring data coming from the North America and Europe to say that they haven't actually seen more cases of COVID in these cohorts. So, you know, even patients, there's case reports of patients post bone marrow transplant, patients on chemotherapy that also had mild disease. So I think we need to be very aware that we cannot look at risk in isolation. We have to balance that with the harms of not being in school, you know, and, and there's vulnerable children who do not have access to, to e-learning, who do not have laptops, internets, tablets, who do not even maybe have food at home, you know, and so the school plays a vital part in, in the child's overall well-being. And I think there are risks, of course, but I do not think that's unsurmountable. I think it's, it's risks that can be managed, that can be minimized, that can be monitored. And if there is a need to close down a school, then close down a specific class, a specific school, where there is cases, rather than have this blanket statement of no schools anywhere. You know, so I think a more gray approach rather than this extreme black and extreme white approach is what we, what's necessary. Yeah, I think, thank you, that that makes a lot of sense. And like you say, as we go along, we learn more. We've got to be able to say we maybe did it 
slightly wrong or not wrong we thought it was the right way but to adjust as we go along and make it more gray let's get to finish off get to some practical recommendations if you do have a child and that's small percentage that actually test positive um, basic guidelines for home what they should do what you can give the child or how to treat because we know it's a virus we don't have a specific mm. treatment but what would you recommend what can a mum do at home for their child Yes, I mean, I think there's, there's growing evidence that definitely zinc plays a vital role, not just for COVID, but we've known that for gastrointestinal disease and respiratory illnesses for many years. So a, a zinc supplement combined with vitamin C and vitamin D, I think is helpful in terms of managing the temperature. If there is a temperature or pain and discomfort, we recommend only using paracetamol, which is Panado or cowpole, as it's known, and try and avoid other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Nurofen or Brufen. And I think then the question becomes, if your child is a high risk with an underlying comorbidity, discuss it with your specialist. They might recommend um, other therapies that you may have heard about, like hydroxychloroquine, but that that the use of that for now in children is really for those who are in an ICU setting or who has severe critical disease, which is less than 5% of all children. So I think when to contact your pediatrician or your general practitioner is um, if your child obviously complains of shortness of breath, difficulty to breathe, or you notice they have labored breathing, they may look very lethargic or their color may change. If your child is unable to drink enough fluids and may start to become dehydrated with dry mouth, uh, not crying tears if they're a baby, not passing urine, or if they have poor perfusion, if their hands and feet are cold and you can't, uh, they look blotchy or develop a blotchy rash, or there's a change in their cognition, they become confused, they become very sleepy and you can't arouse them. I think those are the things that obviously need to make you get to the emergency department or to discuss it with your specialist if they're immediately available. But um, I think for the most part what that parents will notice is that the symptoms are very similar to many other respiratory tract infections that your child may have had in the past in at least 50 to to 80 percent of cases thank you very much um i think yeah that has been very helpful i think we can really have um hope and i think the the future looks a lot brighter than people think thank you for your time yeah. and um yeah thank you yeah. for this very insightful discussion uh, maybe people should listen to it twice because it's, there's some great things in it and it's important so we, that we can get the schools open hopefully as soon as possible. Oh, yeah, and I, I mean, I want to reiterate, I think that there's so much information out there and so much misinformation, um, but also I think what, what sometimes is lacking is insight and context. You know, being able to take the information and apply it in a specific context is very, very important because otherwise fear takes over everything and then we do not make rational decisions anymore. I want to just recommit that from a pediatric society, we are all there, we're all prepared, we're all knowledgeable, we're sharing data, we're sharing information, we're in constant contact with one another and we are available. We are here to answer your questions and support you. Thank you, Fiona Kretzinger. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Yes, and that was Dr. Kretzinger that I had um, a wonderful discussion with. Thank you for joining us. Remember, um, we will get through this. Do the right thing. Wear the mask. Wash your hands. And don't fear. If we have knowledge and we make wise decisions, we'll do the right thing. Stay home. Stay healthy. And when you do go to school, enjoy it.